Good, good. How you doing, buddy? It is my pleasure to introduce Admiral Jonathan Greenert, our 30th Chief of Naval Operations. A native of Butler, Pennsylvania, Admiral Greenert has served at every level of command to include command of USS Honolulu, 7th Fleet, U.S. Fleet Forces Command, and now as our Chief of Naval Operations. Following command of USS Honolulu, Admiral Greenert was presented the Admiral Stockdale Award for Visionary Leadership. Accompanying CNO is our Navy's 13th Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy. Mick Pond Stevens was born and raised in Montana. Following graduation from high school in May 1983, he immediately entered the U.S. Navy and became an aviation structural mechanic. Mick Pond Stevens has served in a multitude of operational commands, and prior to assuming duties as Mick Pond, served as Fleet Master Chief for Commander, U.S. Fleet Forces Command. Our Navy could not be in better hands. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Admiral Greenert and Mick Pond Stevens. All right, welcome. Hello, everybody. How y'all doing? You all may be thinking, you guys can kind of relax for a minute and we'll give the oath here. He's saying, what's with it? These two clowns come into town and it's freezing cold. You ought to be happy. Last year when I came for what is really, I'm here for the Navy League dinner tonight, we had a snowstorm. So you're actually getting a small, nobody thought that was funny at all. I say, <laughs> we're not laughing because it's cold. And I, I'm still cold. I don't know about you from being outside. So you all re-enlisting? You all ready to go? All right. Um, one more time. You all ready to re-enlist? Yes, sir. <laughs> it was Friday afternoon effect. Okay, so without further ado, uh, tell you what, I'll come over here and that way you can be there, McPon. All right. Uh, please, attention to oath. We will uh, administer the oath for the re-enlistment. Raise your right hand. And repeat after me. I, state your name. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all, enemies, against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I obey the orders of the President of the United States. And the officers appointed over me. In accordance with regulations. And the, and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So help me God. All right, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Major. Congratulations. What's your name? Sean Anderson, sir. Anderson? Yes, and where are you from? Mejia, Texas. Mejia, Texas? Yes, sir. Is that near Dallas? It's close to Fort Hood, sir. Fort Hood? Uh, so you don't care about sports teams or anything like that? No, sir. Okay, well, you're honest. That's good. That's always good. Congratulations, buddy. What's your name? Lee Foreman. Lee Foreman. Foreman? Where are you from? Las Vegas, Nevada. Las Vegas? Is this your family? Oh, he's got his family. We've got to take another picture. Hi. And who would this be? What's your name, man? Melinda? Very nice. Where'd you say you're from again? Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Did you meet him in Las Vegas? No? <laughs> you wouldn't admit it if you did, would you? <laughs> and who would this be? My son, Elijah. Elijah? How you doing, buddy? Yeah, it's good to see you. So uh, where are you from then? This? New you're York. Not New York? So where'd you guys meet? Sasebo, Japan. Sasebo, Japan? Okay, it all came together. I, <laughs> that makes total sense to me. I see. Well, let's get a picture here, and then we'll come back and get that one. Photographer, you ready? All right. Got that? All right, excellent. You got that? He's got the Mick Pond's head in the way. <laughs> Who cares? So you got it? That's the one that matters. Okay. All right, where are you from, miss? I'm cut right in front. Are you from this area? Did you meet here, then? Yeah. All right, who's this? Hi. Hi. Huh? Your name? Okay, here's coin, buddy. All right. Okay. You want a picture of the Mick Pond? <laughs> what are you going to say? No, I don't want him in here. Go ahead. He don't have a choice. It. Yeah, why not? Hey, I didn't give you a coin. The wives do all the work around That's here. That's right. I my coin. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Good manners. Congratulations. How you doing, buddy? Tell him. Uh, where are you from? Uh, Florence, South Carolina. Florence, South Carolina? You married? Kind of rich, aren't you? 
You got a little money? Wish. You wish? <laughs> you got hobbies, right? We won't talk about that if that's all right with you. Okay, that's good. All right, buddy, where are you from? Uh, what's your name? Sorry. Lee? Where are you from? Los Angeles, California. Los Angeles? Very nice. Uh, you're like a Lakers fan or any of that stuff? You don't watch sports? Too busy. Professional. Study, 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 right? Okay. I gave you a coin, right? Okay, great. Hey, Chief, how you doing? Where are you from? Georgia. Georgia? Uh, are you a Georgia Bulldog fan or any of that stuff? You don't like sports either, right? I'm striking out here, ladies and gentlemen. I'm dying up here. Very good. Man, you've got a lot of warfare device. You're a busy person, huh? Very good. So you grew up your whole life down there? Yes, sir. All right, very good. What color is coins? He what? He's coins. Oh, I didn't give you a coin? I must have been, it must have been that whole thing. I was, I was just mystified that uh, you didn't have any hobbies, or your hobbies are, you're broke. <laughs> you're broke, okay. Well, thank you all very much. How about a hand for our re -enlisting? Yeah. You all can sit down if you like. <laughs> All right, you're going to do some sort of magic yes, that. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. How you doing, Master Chief? How you doing? Hey guys, good. Thanks. Okay, attention to award. The President of the United States takes pleasure in presenting the Bronze Star Medal Gold Star in lieu of second award with valor to Chief Special Warfare Operator Charles Fung, United States Navy for heroic achievement in connection with combat operations against the enemy as senior enlisted advisor and in direct support of Operation Enduring Freedom from September 2012 to June 2013. Demonstrating outstanding leadership and resolve under fire, he led his team during 210 combat patrols as, and 15 well-organized insurgent attacks. On 27 September 2012, Chief Fung bravely coordinated the defense of his remote operating base against heavy rocket, mortar, and automatic weapons fire during a complex enemy attack from multiple elevated fighting positions. While bounding between defensive fighting positions and simultaneously engaging the enemy, he tactfully maneuvered his fire teams, ensuring the swift medical treatment of a wounded teammate. During a combat reconnaissance patrol on 17 October 2012, Chief Fung displayed exceptional courage against an insurgent ambush. He led his element through a fast-flowing river and rugged terrain, drawing overwhelming enemy fire away from his isolated sniper element, creating relief and enabling the safe egress from their vulnerable position. His combat leadership and decisive actions ensured the overall safety of his team and the overwhelming success of the mission. For the President, B.L. Losey, Rear Admiral, United States Navy. It's a pleasure to give you this. All right. Nice to see you. Good. All right, where are you from? Where'd you grow Queens, up? Queens, New York, sir. Queens, New York? Are you a Mets fan? Yeah, I am. <laughs> and proud of it, right? Real, real New Yorkers are Mets fans, sir. Oh, okay. There's a little bit of challenge out there, but we'll leave that one go. It's my pleasure. Congratulations. President of the United States placed pleasure in presenting the Bronze Star Medal with Valor to Chief Special Warfare Operator Scott M. Letelier, United States Navy, for heroic achievement in connection with combat operations against the enemy as Senior Enlisted Advisor and in direct support of Operation Enduring Freedom on 5 November 2012. During a combat reconnaissance patrol, Chief Petty Officer Letelier led a 34-man force through highly kinetic and enemy-controlled terrain. Along the route, his element discovered a 30-pound improvised explosive device, at which time he quickly cleared the area and relayed the threat to the ground force commander. He displayed exceptional bravery and combat leadership against a vicious insurgent ambush from three elevated fighting positions. He immediately engaged the enemy while maneuvering his fire teams in a decisive counterattack. 
Upon identifying that his element had sustained a casualty from the effective machining gunfire, he left his place of cover, ran to the down man, dragged him to cover, and assisted in providing critical combat casualty care. While still under relentless incoming fire, he took control of two F-16 fighter jets and conducted three gun runs against the entrenched enemy. His actions allowed for the egress of the casualty while suppressing the enemy threat and enabled the safe return of all friendly forces. For the President, B.L. Losey, Rear Admiral, United States Navy. Chief. Privilege to uh, award this medal. So congratulations. Sir. Okay. Where are you from, Chief? Plainview, New York. Plainview, New York. All right. Are you a New York, New York kind of sports fan or whatever? Yeah, Giants, really. Giants. <laughs> Holy cow! You know, I need to separate you two. <laughs> you guys will be all right. Okay. Congratulations. Sir. Pleasure. You know, I didn't give these guys. Chief, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Chief. Okay, proceed. Secretary of the Navy takes pleasure in presenting the Navy Commendation Medal to Master at Arms First Class Harry St. Felix, United States Navy. For meritorious service while serving as Security Department Leading Petty Officer at Jeb Little Creek Fort Story from October 2012 to September 2013. Displaying exceptional skills and resourcefulness, Petty Officer St. Felix's singular efforts resulted in his selection as Jeb's 2013 Sailor of the Year. Demonstrating comprehensive knowledge and exceptional leadership, he guided and skillfully managed the 88 military and 64 civilian law enforcement officers responsible for providing force protection and law enforcement services within the Mid-Atlantic region. For the Secretary of the Navy, F.E. Hewlett, Captain United States Navy. You're running out of room for a Navy Achievement Medal, so this is a good thing. That's right. Congratulations to you. Uh, I got a coin here. Where are you from? Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn, New York? Man, we're, we're like drunk on New York up here, aren't we, huh? You guys, let me go over there. We'll get a picture. Good? He's getting nervous holding my hand. <laughs> okay. Thank you. How are you today? Good to see you. The Secretary of the Navy takes pleasure in presenting the Navy Achievement Medal to Electronics Technician 3rd Class David Velasquez, United States Navy, for professional achievement in the superior performance of his duties while serving as Work Center Supervisor and Color Guard Coordinator at Jeb Little Creek Fort Story from October 2012 to September 2013. Displaying exceptional skills and resourcefulness, Petty Officer Velasquez's singular efforts resulted in his selection as Jeb's 2013 Junior Sailor of the Year. His direct leadership ensured the flawless supervision of 65 audiovisual setups, supporting both the staff and 130 resident commands, while also professionally coordinating over 50 color guard ceremonies throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. For the Secretary of the Navy, F.E. Hewlett, Captain United States Navy. Good job. Good? All right. Congratulations to you. Where are you from? Jersey City, New Jersey. Jersey City, New Jersey. Man, we can't get away from this area. <laughs> I think the NFL is uh, up here advertising the Super Bowl in New York here, and they got all these guys out here. Anyway, please proceed. Sir. Secretary of the Navy takes pleasure in presenting the Navy Achievement Medal to Master at Arms Seaman Austin Mumford, United States Navy, for professional achievement and the superior performance of his duties while serving as Armory Ready for Issue Custodian at Jeb Little Creek Fort Story from October 2012 to September 2013. His display of exceptional skills and resourcefulness resulted in selection as Jeb's 2013 Blue Jacket of the Year. His diligence while managing the midshift armory resulted in the flawless daily accountability of 334 M9 pistols, 60 M4 rifles, 43 M500 shotguns, 11 M11 pistols, 9 M240s, and 238 calibers with zero discrepancies. For the Secretary of the Navy, Effie Hewlett, Captain United States Navy. Thank you. Where'd you grow up? Pennsylvania, where? Harrisburg. Harrisburg? All right. Well, at least we're out of New York. Yeah, we're Eagles, there, yeah. <laughs> Eagles, oh my God. You guys are going to have a fight right up here. Hi, officer. How are you? Good to see you. Commander, Joint Expeditionary Base Little Creek Fort Story takes pleasure in commending Police Major William Johnson for professional achievement in the superior performance of his duties as Security Operations Officer and Acting Precinct Commander from 1 October 2012 through 30 September 2013. You consistently performed your demanding duties in an exemplary and highly professional manner, which resulted in selection as Jeb Little Creek Fort Story 2013 Civilian of the Year. Throughout this period, your outstanding performance, dedication to duty, and personal involvement in command operations significantly contributed to the overall mission of Little Creek Fort Story. 
You were instrumental in the management and oversight during the extremely successful higher headquarters operational assessment, NCIS military working dog inspection, and the explosive safety inspection, all of which were outstanding. You also managed two furlough periods significantly impacting over 20 personnel, signed F.E. Hewlett, Captain United States Navy. Congratulations. You don't want that coin, that's another one. Here, I'll give you this one. Look over there, we'll get a picture. Where'd you grow up, sir? Jackson, Tennessee. Jackson, Tennessee. Very nice. So uh, what is the, you know, these guys got medals for being, you know, sailor of the year and all that other stuff in, in uh, action. What do you get for uh, being civilian of the year? You coin? <laughs> Give this guy a parking spot or something, a Starbucks, a month of some. I tell you what, Skipper, you got to do something here. I'll let you take that on, okay? Yes, sir. All right. Then drop me an email when we figure out what we do with this fine gentleman, will you? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Okay, Gator. please have a seat. Uh, we'll try not to bunch up and down so much, and that would be good. Well, giving these awards reminds me of the kind of the vast amount of, of duties and jobs and missions, and you guys are out and about, and it's been that way for well over a decade, a decade and a half here. So it's great for the Mick Pond and I to be here in, in Little Creek. Uh, and CLU, the very disparate commands. I love the green uniforms. They're, they all just kind of fit in very well. You guys got the comfy uh, uh, kind of jackets on, whatever I call uh, what am I thinking of shells, I guess, uh, there. And I guess we can talk about that some other time. Just a couple of words uh, from me, and I'll ask the Mick Pond if he wants any. But what we get out of this more than anything is listening and learning. And I know we're streaming out there, so we say hi to all you out there on Webland uh, that uh, are listening here uh, and what we're going to talk about today. Uh, for the families, I see some families here. We had some up here, and I see civilians. Uh, remember, you guys are our shipmates. For the families, you're the wind underneath the wings of those of us that get the opportunity to serve, and I thank you very much for what you do. Those folks up here that were re-enlisted, it doesn't happen without your support, so thank you all very much. For you civilians who are out, I saw you some out there. Uh, some of you out there, sorry, in the, in the back of the auditorium, uh, the, the uh, theater here. Uh, thank you for what you're doing out there. You are truly, you know, our partners in all this. Uh, it's been a tough year. I mean, we were, we had a continued resolution, then we had sequestration, then we shut down, we furloughed. It was awful, you know, and of course we froze. So and we're still cold. So, but all of that taken up, uh, it's very regrettable, but uh, I want to thank you for what you're doing. You're a major, major part of the team. So now as we look ahead, what do we got to look at? What do we have out there in the future? Well, there's this commercial that's kind of popular out there about, uh, I think it's around, around, about DirecTV, if this, if this, if this, if this, you know, and it's kind of humorous. Uh, we have a stable budget now. We have a budget, and we're going to have a budget next year, an agreement, a number. And when you get that, and when you have a stable budget, then you can plan ahead, and you don't have to furlough, and you don't have to do hiring freezes, and you know where the ships can do maintenance, and then you can plan maintenance. And when you can plan maintenance, the company can plan maintenance. And therefore, you don't pay a premium for that, and you'll get more work done in the shipyard. And when you have a budget, you can plan on training and not just the next deployers, so you can get ready for that and get that going. When you have a budget that is very, very close to what you asked for, then you can continue your civilian hiring and get some of the backlog on your bases done. So we have uh, a lot to sort of look forward for in 14. It's all relative, I'll give you that, compared to where we were in the last 18 months. But it's looking much further up. Uh, for those of you that do amphibious operations and expeditionary operations, uh, the joint high, the, you know, the spearhead just left, and we got uh, the Choctaw here getting ready to go at some time in the future, and we'll have another joint high-speed vessel uh, shortly. Uh, we have a mobile landing platform. Some of you may not know what that is. I didn't bring pictures today, but it is a huge uh, sea-based support ship that provides lots of volume of, of ship-to-shore uh, equipment and material, and she's going to uh, do her shakedown this year, and she'll be on deployment about one year from now. We have a second one of these large ships. They're 
They're almost as big as a big deck amphib. Uh, and we have another one that we'll commission here next Saturday. We have a third, we have a float forward staging base, which is almost as big with, and the float forward staging base I'm talking about has an enormous uh, flight deck, almost as big as a big deck amphib, but it's not a big deck amphib. It's a support, sea based support ship. That's 50% done, so that's coming on. We'll commission this year, I'm sorry, we'll deliver here coming up uh, in the near future the DDG 1000, and that is the Zoom Wall. Very, very high tech, forward reaching uh, of one of our destroyers. We'll get also an SSN this year, so we're going to have a lot of ships delivering this year. Our shipbuilding account in fiscal year 14, with the bill that we got, uh, fulfills all that we asked for. We were looking a little ragged there before the Congress took action, so our shipbuilding account gets kind of back on track for those things that we needed. When it comes to uh, the personnel accounts and the pay and all that, we did fine this year in fiscal year 14. Uh, tuition assistance will remain like it was in 13, that is full funded uh, as we go into that. Uh, we want to look at your uh, CPAY, and we are studying that to see what is a proper amount of CPAY. The Chief of Naval Personnel has put out some information on that, blogs, you'll see it on sites. Uh, we want to basically increase the CPAY to keep up with uh, inflation over the vast number of years, almost a decade, more than a decade of time that it has sort of uh, atrophied, and we want to catch that back up. So we're working on, on that. So there's a lot going on out there. Uh, we still have this challenge that sits on the front burner that we have got to continue to work on called sexual assault. We are making progress in there, but we are, we are not we are near being done. But I ask you to keep the focus on that. Remember what we need to do. You deserve a good command climate, one of dignity and respect. Those of you that are leaders that are part of that team, I expect you to maintain a climate of dignity and respect and continue to push on that and make sure we are doing the right thing by our sailors. You want to say anything before we take Q&A? It's uh, great to be at uh, Joint Expeditionary Base, Little Creek, uh, Fort Story. Congratulations once again to our re-enlistees and our re-enlistees' families. Thank you for raising your hand today and, and sticking around for a little bit longer. And to our awardees, congratulations to you and your awards. Uh, uh, pretty darn impressive and very much appreciated. We look forward to your, your questions today. This is how we keep our finger on the pulse, is being out here having conversations with the fleet. If I know if I don't get the opportunity to do this CNO, then I can quickly become detached and not really understand all the challenges, the issues, and just as importantly, the best practices that all of you uh, use every day to lead your, your, your folks. So I uh, look forward to a good all hands call and I'm ready to get started CNO. Okay, who's up? How you doing, sir? Uh, Good. Master Chief, how you doing? MA2 Bradley, Coastal River Marine Squadron 4. Uh, I have a simple question. Uh, it really relates to Naval Expeditionary Combat Command. Um, basically, I'm just trying to wonder, where do you see NECC going within the next couple of years? Since our footprint and everything is uh, getting smaller in the Middle East and whatnot, do you see us shifting towards Africa more, or are we just like kind of just going to not really have any more missions coming our way? No, um, you have a lot of mission. There's uh, insatiable appetite out there that comes in from all the geographic combat commanders. Southcom would like to see a lot more of you down there along that coastal riverine, especially to work with the local navies uh, down there to maintain river security uh, in and around uh, South America. AFRICOM has a, a big request in as well. CENTCOM continues that. So as we consolidate and make you the you know, combat riverine force, and c then that will continue apace. As we continue to, to uh, adjust the size, which means it'll get a little bit smaller, but the skill sets that NECC has today, we need to maintain. I don't want to get rid of anything. There's a, a couple of small, that, but anything adjustment we make has to be able to be reconstitutable. That means dialed back up uh, in relatively short order. Uh, we need to build, uh, continue to, to, to replace some of the boats that we had and make them uh, good and mm -hmm. lethal. And so we'll continue with that. Right so it, it will be adjusted, which means it'll be a little bit smaller. It will. That's just a fact. 
but uh, there's, it's not like there's no mission. Roger that. Thank you, sir. Hello. Good afternoon, Admiral. Hi. Good afternoon, CNO. <laughs> Sorry. I know what you mean. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Um, I have a two-part question. In lieu of the two incidences involving military aircraft in the area, has that had an adverse effect on our military pilots? And what preventive measures have been implemented to eliminate or lessen another tragic incident like that in this area? So you uh, the helicopter and the jet incidents? Yes, Those are the two you're referring to? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, well, we're doing investigations to find precisely what happened. But it would appear to be, it would appear to be, as we look at it, uh, very, very sketchy. And that, that one was material, probably the helicopter. It appears that way, whereas the jet, uh, it doesn't, it did, there was an, another wingman, if you will, another individual doing a, a 1v1. They were doing some training. And it didn't appear that there was a uh, failure, a, a, a material failure. So we're, we're looking at two different things. One might have been a material failure in a helicopter doing some basic training off the coast. One was two strike fighters doing uh, a, a training, uh, a very, um, an event that they both knew about. So it's, I got a left hand, right hand, I'm kind of indicating. We think they're sort of different. But uh, we've done safety stand down and said, OK, everybody, just to make sure you get the very basics, because safety is first, that's one. And then we're moving as quickly as feasible uh, to take care of, uh, well, to understand the cause. It's a tragic thing, and it was in, it's in this community that we lost those lives. That, that's awful. And uh, we owe it to make sure that we look very closely into this, what the cause was. All right, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. Three back at Velasco, CRS4. Um, I have a question. I understand the concept of placing Navy members according to the big Navy's uh, needs. However, why is it that after a period of time, once most qualifications are exceeded or met, do we allocate subject matter experts to different commands that are irrelevant to the previous training? So why do we move people once they become experts so that quickly? Is, yes. Yes, sir. Well, uh, I think what you're saying, why not keep people aboard a unit longer? That is true, sir. Does that, does that sound about right? Yes, sir. Conceptually speaking, I'd love to do that. But if you do that, you upset a seashore rotation because there's a, a place ashore for somebody to go after a, a sea tour, and that's predominantly what I think we're talking about. Um, some people may want to extend and take another sea tour. Some can stay on a unit. Others would move somewhere else. Uh, kiddo, what we like to do is give you a broad breadth, you know, vast spectrum of experiences. And if you stay a long time on one given unit, uh, that may or may not be good for the unit. If you're a great sailor, that skipper will never want to let go with you. But somebody needs to come in behind you that you need to train, and they need to grow, and you need to move on to another area. You say, well, why not longer? Well, we're looking at longer sea tours, but that gets arduous depending on what unit you're on. So some people would love it and some people wouldn't. And that gets a little bit back to when I opened up and say, what are we, how do we compensate people for sea duty? Is it about right and what is the right balance? So we're looking at that. Do you want to say anything on that? No, I agree. It's, um, most of our communities, because we're a sea-centric organization, most of our billets are sea billets. Uh, you take the surface force, for example, there, there's simply not an opportunity uh, if you don't rotate people out of there to give folks an opportunity to go to shore uh, and get a little, you know, downtime to some degree. So, I, CNO, we've answered that question before, and, and uh, when I do all hands call, I say exactly what you just said. It's about opportunity, and if we don't rotate folks through, then we don't provide everybody that opportunity. Thank you, sir. I got to tell you, it's rare that I, I get somebody to come up and say, could we stay at sea longer? <laughs> <laughs> I know that's not what you said personally. Please go ahead. Hello, miss. Afternoon, CNO, Master Chief. BM2 Lamore from USS Woodby Island. My question is in relation to uh, retention efforts and the process. I know PTS has gone through a change and is now Seaway. Uh, with new ships coming out, those who were forced uh, due to PTS to convert or get out, um, 
what are their kind of chances of trying to get back into their previous rates uh, to try and like man up those newer ships? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I can speak to you more theory than the actual, because there is no exact program to go back. But if, if people moved to another rating as a result of PTS, the one they left was overmanned. I mean, that's why they did it. They're, they wanted to re-enlist. They said, look, we're overmanned in the rating you are, especially in that rate, I'm sorry, in that rank. And so folks went to an, another one that, another rating that where they were really needed. To come back, if that is now kind of lesser manned or there's a need for it, uh, theoretically we could do that. And theoretically we ought to be looking at that when you would come up to re-enlist in you know, this other rating, if that makes sense to you. But if to cross-rate again, I don't know that there's a process to do that right now. You heard it? Yeah, so... The uh, way she's describing it. Right, and, and when sailors, as the CNO just said, when a sailor was separated through PTS is because their rate was overmanned. But if you remember, before they separated, they were afforded opportunities to cross-rate into other fields, right, if they qualified. So in order to be separated through PTS, what that really means is that the person, for whatever reason, uh, was not able to convert into one of those open rates. So if they got out of the Navy and they wanted to come back in, there's a high probability that they'd be asked to come back in into one of those rates that they didn't qualify for when they separated unless their ASVAB scores went up or they had a medical condition they were able to resolve. So this is, would really be a case-by-case -case basis because when you come back in, you come back in as a NAVET, as a, you know, a, a, a former sailor and there's a whole nother process for coming into the Navy under that process. I haven't really, I haven't heard of anybody who's came back in after being PTS uh, or have gone home through the PTS process, but probably a good question to ask uh, Admiral Moran, our, our yeah. CMP. So there's somebody writing down all the questions, not your name, just the question. <laughs> and we go back and we look through these to see if there's policy changes needed. So we got that, that piece of it. I misheard your question. I thought you were saying somebody who re-enlisted into another rating to come back into the rating, not separated, forgive me. Uh, my, my question is more geared towards those for who had to change, more change rates who yeah. are still in the Navy. Okay, so to come back into the rating. Yes. I, I think it, again, it, it would be a request to cross rate again, and it would be what is the situation in the rating you left? You're saying, well, it may open. And I'm saying, okay, we'd have to take a look at that. Okay, thank you, sir. Hey. Good afternoon, sir. Mick Pond. Petty Officer First Class Ryan Gauss, Coast River Marine Squadron 4. Uh, I was curious, um, will the current standard for the retirement program be around and remain in place for the next 10 years? The, uh, you mean the, <laughs> the retirement program as you know it? Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, there are kids in Great Lakes today, there are kids in high school, frankly, who will join, who will then go to Great Lakes and enter the Navy. Any new retirement program will be grandfathered to the one, uh, if, you're, if you have a uniform on, that's your retirement program. I mean, that's, that's the deal, if you will, where we as the chief said, look, if we're going to change the retirement program, where we stand is, those that are in came in uh, with a covenant, and that's maybe the, maybe the reason you joined. Although I don't know if you all know it, but about 17 out of 100 ever stay to 20 years. So there's, there's 100 here, there's only 17 here that it would apply to. That's not my point. My point is uh, that it should be available to you. So the answer to your question is yes. Thank you, sir. I I'm just taking a stab at it, but I think you probably have about 10 years in the Navy. Just over eight, Master Chief. <laughs> Good afternoon, sir. Nick Bond. Hi. My question is, how will an increased Arctic presence affect deployments and deployment time? I know that we are going to be supplementing the Coast Guard with goings on in the Arctic region. I was just wondering how that's going to affect our deployments. Did you say Arctic? Yes, sir. Yeah, it feels like it today, doesn't it? A bit. Um, I don't know yet. I don't think it will be that big, and here's where I'm coming from. I, had, I asked the oceanographer of the Navy to un so that we could understand where the heck we're going on Arctic operations. Number one, show me the scientific evidence studies that are done on how big the ice will be, and yes, it is getting smaller. So that was one, and he did that. And I, I don't have any slides here today. So, 
But if you go to the website, our website, and you fish around there, you should find the Arctic slide. We have it posted. But here's the deal. It, uh, yes, it gets smaller. Okay, so what are the transit lanes in the Arctic that we'd want to watch? And there are three general ones. One runs through what's called the Northwest Passage in northern Canada. One is called the Northern Route, and that goes up near Siberia all the way around. And then there's one that is uh, north of Canada, if you will, but not on the Russian side. So there's three basic routes, but the, the number of weeks a year that they are truly ice-free in 2025 is not that extraordinary. It's not like half the year. Number two, or three, as you look at it, how deep is the water in those areas? It, it's actually not all that deep in certain parts, 50, 60 feet maybe. Well, how deep draft, how much deep draft, you go down to Norfolk and you look at those big container ships, their draft is 50 feet in some cases. And so if, if it's not going to be a deep enough draft for those folks to go up and use that route, they're not going to use it. So there are a lot of factors here that need to be worked out. Uh, what kind of security is needed up there? Well, what kind of security threat do we have? Is it as simple as the South Atlantic where there's no threat and ships go back and forth? Or is it as complicated as, say, where we have pirates? Uh, although I'm not saying pirates would be up there, but you get my point. We would need security. We're still working through that. Right now, I'm not overwhelmed with a, with a requirement. But I will leave you with the point you made. We have to support the Coast Guard if something goes bad up there. And uh, so we have to be sort of a supporting element, and we have to, we have to be able to respond to go up there. But I, I don't have a lot of uh, patrols kind of laid out in the, in the years ahead of 2025, but we are watching what does it take to operate there? What kind of systems, communications, uh, what kind of clothing do you need? All of those things we are working on. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Mick Pond. Uh, Q1 memory EWTG Lamp. Um, sir, my question is, are there any plans in the future to revise uh, the way that we, the Navy does uh, compute the BCA? Do you, do you have any ideas? <laughs> no, Master Chief. If you, if you got some, I'm willing to listen to them. There's, there's really only a couple ways of doing it, right? There's the tape, the height weight, uh, there's a skin fold caliper, and there's kind of a tank that you can weigh people in. The, and we get whatever we decide we need to do, or we have to be able to do it everywhere, a sea, at sea, ashore, overseas, right? So that kind of puts the tank out of the, out of the process. Too expensive, too clumsy, not enough of them. I looked at the skinfold caliper online. I was curious about it, so I went to, to YouTube it. I would encourage you, if anybody has thought about using a skinfold caliper, to, to go to YouTube and look and see how it's done. It's a pretty complex, complicated process that... I would, I would think that we would get a lot more complaints on that than we would on the tape. So uh, right now, I think, uh, unless someone comes up with something better that uh, for the foreseeable future, the height weight is probably the best thing that we have, not perfect, but it's the best thing we have uh, that gets us kind of in the middle. Uh, because the other two options right now, unless there's something else I don't know about, kind of seem a little bit more difficult or challenging. Thank you, Massey. Thanks, sir. Good afternoon, sir. McPon, uh, hey. CM2 Tressler with Log Suit Group 2. Uh, I got a question with the, the, the whole continuing of the battalions being decommed for CBs and then uh, the troops getting forced to cross rate because they're not picked up for CBs again. What do you see the future for the CBs in the next 10 years? Well, I, I can't speak to the, the. Are you talking within the CB community, the cross rate forcing? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, to, to balance out the, the ratings, I guess, in there. Well, the, the deal is the, the cost to maintain the number of battalions active and reserve were, and, and the demand in the future, again, it's an insatiable appetite, what we thought was balanced. Uh, we adjusted the number of active and reserve. Bottom line is we put more battalions into the reserve, retired a few. Uh, I think we're about stable where we are now, so if you're saying, oh, are you going to go visit this in the future? I don't see it right now. Uh, the things that you said, you know, the, the cross rating, that kind of stuff, help balance it out. There's some issues that need to be taken care of in the reserve battalions. You know, wh what, what do we do with these folks, these skill sets that we have? They can still uh, provide something to the Navy, but where? And uh, the, the Chief Naval Reserve, Admiral Braun, is looking closely at that with our folks. Anything to add? 
Thank you very much, sir. Sure. Good afternoon, CNO, Mick Pine, hey. GMC Ward, SEAL Team 18. My question falls more along the lines of uh, training and readiness and records management. Right now we have about seven different systems to track records from Bupers Online, Flea Temps, um, DJRS, NERM, like seven different systems. Uh, is there any plan in place to compile that down to one or maybe even two even systems so that we don't have to go through seven different systems to try to find one piece of data? So what I gather from your comments and your tone is you're pretty satisfied with where we're at, right? <laughs> Not necessarily. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of challenging, isn't it? it one, is. one could even say that it's a mess. You know, CNO, uh, not too long ago, charged one of our senior flag officers with taking a look at this very problem that you mentioned and some other things. And we call it the, it's the RAD effort, re uh, reduction of administrative distractions. And I've had a chance to look at this list of things that they've put on there that make our lives more difficult than they need to be. Because the Navy's very good about, we've been, since I've been, and very good about adding to, but we're not always good about taking away, right? And at some point, you've got to say, okay, where are we? And that's what they're doing right now. They put this list together, and what I'll share with you is what you just said is one of the priorities on that list to look at how do we get all these systems into a one, two, or three uh, area of program. But we got to be careful not to put it all in one area because then you have a single point of failure, right? So if the system shuts down, everything shuts down. Uh, and so there's a need to have more than one, but we don't know how many right now. And so they're working on it. At some point, they're going to come back to the CNO and say, here's what we recommend, and we'll take it from there. That system, is that 21st Century Sailor, the, the uh, Naval Personnel Command put together when we got rid of PTS? That, that too, is the part of bringing Right. E-knowledge online and all that together. So there's a twofold thing. Get rid of the junk, consolidate, and bring together a common system for your record, your, your career, so you can go to one, one place. This is going to take a few years. It's going to take a few years. Uh, but if you're asking, is somebody looking at it? Yes, we are, for right. sure. Thank you. Okay. Let's go over on the left, because we haven't done that. Good afternoon, CNO. Hi. McPon. CTN3 Robertson, Navy Information Operations Command. Um, my question is, with the creation of the Cyber Protection Team and the increase of the CTN rating, how much more do you see uh, the cyber field being integrated into the rest of the Navy? How much more do I see? Cyber as a, a field. Uh, big time. Uh, throughout uh, sequestration and all these things I opened up with, gee whiz, we got, you know, got slowed down and all that. Uh, that was an area we didn't slow down at all. The, the monies that we had, we made sure we invested in that so that the cyber teams that you spoke to uh, continue to grow. They had a, in the initial operational capability, and we're looking at final operation. These cyber warfare is going on right now. I know you live it. Uh, yes, and so we cannot stop. We have to forge ahead. Okay, sir. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, We'll go port starboard. Good afternoon, CNO, Mick Pond, uh, QM2 Wilson. I'm stationed in Little Creek Port Ops. Last time I saw you guys, I was on the way city, so it's good to see you guys How again. How about that? Um, November. Yeah, November. We've, uh, we've been hearing a lot of speculation about our BAH, and I was just wondering, should we be expecting any changes at all to that? Um, it's hard to say, but let me, let me tell you what I mean by that. If, what it has to happen, if there's going to be a change, it will be in the president's budget, which we would submit, and uh, I think the first week in March is when that's scheduled to go up to the Hill. Uh, we are looking at compensation as a broad package. The feeling is today that we spend about 50 cents out of every dollar, a little more than 50 cents out of every dollar on compensation. And, and it's more, more importantly, the rate of growth has been somewhat extraordinary. And as we look at it, we say, we don't think we can continue this, especially in view of the other budgetary reductions and the other costs. So what do we do about this? And the, the sense is, well, if we slow the growth, 
Now, I didn't say reduce. So it's not taking it down. It's slowing the growth that we, we spoke to. So if you look at BAH, BAH has gone up between 4 and 5% every year. And that's based on rent and, and the, the demand, because that's what it's aligned to. People bring their rent shits. So the feeling is if we slow the growth in BAH as it goes out there, now, if you have, let's say you live here and you have a, uh, a lease or a mortgage, as long as you are here hooked to that mortgage with that lease, we're not talking about, okay, click, you, you know, we change it on you. But when you move and you go to another location, the BAH that you get in that location would be different than if we continued the growth. See what I mean? So if the ones that you're on, you would stay on, the ones meaning the agreements. Are you with me so far? Yes, sir. So it's about slowing the growth. So how, how does it look like it's coming out of your pocket? If you assumed it was going to continue to grow and you assumed you were going to continue to pay the rent or mortgage that you had when you moved to another location, then, yeah, that, it would be less than that extrapolated, that difference. But it, it's, uh, that would be the slowing of the growth. That's kind of the BAH story that is under consideration. We have to figure out what we want to submit. Then we have, the Congress has to approve it. Thank you, sir. Okay. Make sense to me. Yeah. Maybe take the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, okay, left, I'm sorry. Good afternoon, sir. A huddling up here. Master Chief, uh, OS1 Arthur James, I would attach the ECRC Norfolk. My question is what would be the timeline for adding female enlisted um, sailors on board on submarines? Okay, you had me there for a minute. I'm going, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Divers? The timeline is uh, in 16 on two submarines, the Texas and the Virginia, and uh, we will have female enlisted on those crews. So we've got to prepare uh, those that want to volunteer and come in and go through boot camp and get that, and those are the two timelines. See, you know, I was, um, I was at the gas station uh, filling up on, to get ready to go back to D.C. this afternoon, and I think there's someone in the audience, they didn't know I was listening to them when they were, they were pumping gas because uh, they said that they had to go to this all-hands call. Uh, <laughs> and it was, it was two young female officers talking, and one of them said, uh, hey, did you hear, there's a flash, she said, that there's going to be openings for females on uh, attack submarines. Uh, are you in the audience? Where are you at? I can't, s come on down. <laughs> no, I didn't, I just didn't listen. Take your time, ma'am. <laughs> no, you can just come up here. I just wanted to see an O to see you. <laughs> so is that where you're headed? Is that what you want to do? That's what you want to do? You got good grades? You got to go to new school, you know. Hey, I made it through. Anybody can make it through. Trust me. They give you second chances. I know. Well, good. Congratulations. I hope you get what you want. Yeah. What do you do now? Um, I'm with CRG2. CRG2? Yes, All right. Great. Great. The, the moral of the story is master chiefs are everywhere. I did see you. Uh, <laughs> I saw you smile when I said it. <laughs> okay. Well, right. thanks. It took guts to come down. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, left, right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Admiral, Master Chief. Thanks very much for coming out to talk to us. My name is Lieutenant Justin Dargan. I'm a Naval Flight Officer here at TACRON 2-1. Uh, my question today stems from something that was asked earlier uh, about the Navy training people for a specific job and then forcing them to uh, change jobs, change commands. Uh, specifically, in my experience in the aviation community, I've seen a lot of my friends and colleagues who become very adept at uh, doing their job in the cockpit, in the plane, uh, but then one of two things happens to them. Either one, they don't make rank and are forced out of the Navy, or two, they do progress up the chain, uh, 05, make command, uh, and they lament uh, that they are no longer able to really fly consistently. Uh, my question to you is, do you know if the Navy would ever consider something like a career flyer program for people yeah. uh, who don't need to progress in rank, but could continue doing the job that they were uh, paid to do. 
Yeah, so. I got to tell you, kiddo, we, we looked at that hard because it's expensive, as you well know, to send you to, uh, I don't know, the War College or anybody, right? And then you come back, and then you got to go to the FRS, right? And we got to train you up, and that's pricey. But we don't have, when we looked at it, the luxury to set aside a group that, hey, you guys just fly, and then somebody else kind of comes in and goes out and does the other things. Those that fly have to lead also in the future. And those leaders, if I don't have somebody that understands combat, cockpit, and all that goes with it, it's really hard to find them to go be, at, to be acceptable on an aircraft carrier or a big deck amphib or an air boss you know, on that. They haven't done it. And, to, and uh, I talk to my counterpart frequently, the first Sea Lord, and they have engineers, uh, say on their, on their, especially in their nuclear power. I was on a submarine talking. They got their engineers and they got their operators. And so, you know, never the twain. There's like a membrane between them. So these guys up forward don't know what the heck's going on back there. And if there's a casualty, it's quite unnerving. Plus, they're trying to maintain two uh, entities and they can't cross-thread. You know what I mean? I think if we had... Uh, if we were in the older days where we had F-4s, we had A-4s, where we had single kind of mission aircraft and a lot of them, rather than the multi-mission aircraft we have today, we may have had to go in that direction. Does that make sense to you? Yes, sir. Uh, there are some folks that actually, they come out of the cockpit and they volunteer to go back in, and, and they actually sort of get away with it, although they don't, in other words, they could go back to back. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there are a gaggle of them, but not many. But that's the deal. It's, it's the rounding of the officer in preparation for when you stand in front of me and the day you come in and raise your right hand, I got to prepare you for 05 command. I just make that assumption. So everything I do for that. When the seaman comes in, I'm thinking chief. You know, Mick Pond and I are thinking that. So that's, as the individual said, why not keep people to see longer? Uh, that's what we like to do. But we, we do study it, trust me. On, does it make sense? The Israelis do it, and they do it quite, quite effectively, but they have a different um, need uh, in their service. Understandable, sir. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the question. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Mass Chief, GM-13, Jeb Little Creek, Fort Story. Uh, just wondering if there was any talks in the near future of changing the winter PT gear. I've been in for 13 years, and that's the only uniform that has never changed. <laughs> You know, when you look at history, especially with clothing and cars and things like that, it seems like it always comes full circle, right? So we build these old cars and we get rid of them, build new ones, and now you see all these like throwback cars coming around. Well, that's what we're thinking with the Navy PTU, right? <laughs> I think we're only about a year away from it being back in style, right? <laughs> sweat gear? Yeah, the sweat, sweat gear, gear. The, the pajamas, right? But uh, it's a great question, and I asked the same thing about four or five years ago they, uh, at, a, at a conference I was at. I don't, uh, they brought in this winter PT gear and said, hey, this is what we're going to try out. We're going to test it. And so they took it to RTC and did all this test wearing. And not too long ago, I said, hey, where's this winter gear at? And they came back and said, yeah, we did the test wearing. It didn't work very well. I said, okay, where are we at? And there, we are nowhere, right? So it's really something that we've got to start back up if we're going to do it because the stuff we had didn't pass the wear test with the recruits. Roger. Thank you, that okay. Chief. Sir. That was a good answer, right? <laughs> it's not a good no, It was an answer. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, Master Chief, uh, BM1 Bay and JB, Little Creek Port Operations. I have a two-part question. Uh, starting February 1, uh, Hampton Roads is putting tolls on all the tunnels going to Portsmouth for the Naval Hospital. Uh, and that's the only ER besides Langley on this side, sir. Uh, wondering if that we were going to get an incentive because we got to pay the toll every time we got to go to the ER, or would there be a possibility of an ER coming to Sewell's Point or here at a Boone Clinic, sir? I don't know. You know I was going to ask how often do you plan on going to the ER? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I haven't, uh, I'd have to give that some thought. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We're going to give this to the local folks. But there, there is a program uh, started years ago, and it, it involved commutes. And the subsidi you're talking about subsidizing commutes. In other yes. words, helping people commute. Yes. And I don't know where this fits in. In the Washington, D.C. area and some other areas, if you take ma rapid transit, you get subsidized because they get you off the road. It's, you know, gas, uh, energy, yada, yada. Uh, I don't know where tolls would fit into something to 
help regulate or enhance your commute. I, I couldn't tell you, but that's probably about the best uh, idea or concept that we would look at to do. But there's a gentleman up here at Ty, writes down everything you guys ask, and we'll look at it. Or we'll, actually, we're going to have to ask locally because it would have to be looked at what is the deal, and it's, it's a state thing. So we got to check it out locally. All yes, right? sir. Thank you. All right. Sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Master Chief. Um, MASA Smith, Base Security. I was curious as to, after the attack, the active shooter situation in the D.C. Navy Yard, I was very surprised that most of the response came from civilian law enforcement. I was curious, during our A school, we were given very basic tactical training. I was curious if any was looked into increasing our training due to we have the equipment, we have the personnel, if we could get the training and start forming it up to have our own to maybe quicken the response time if something like that happened on another base. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, sure, I understand your question. So let me uh, tell you the answer that what was going on at the, at the Navy Yard and in almost all bases, well, you know this, you have agreements with local law enforcement, right? And frankly, the response by people like Navy people, then we had people who were hired to do security, and they have a certain piece of that. Uh, then we have people who are actually civilian uh, police, federal, uh, if you will, police. Then we had the D.C. folks respond. So the response was per the agreement. So what you saw and who got where and how they task organized right there, you just saw what was on the camera and what you kind of thought. There was a lot of other response. It was because the whole base had to be uh, ascertained for the threat. It, we knew about one, building 197, but what about the rest of it? So I think you see what I'm talking about there. So what, what else? Uh, that's all ripe fruit, and in some cases, depending on the agreement, that local agreement, the, the MA, if you will, the, the military force does more than a, but you're saying, no, we want to uh, increase our capability. Um, we'll ask the question, but if we needed it, I think we would kind of do it, if that makes sense. Plus, we got to main, you got to prove that you can do this. We can't train you and say, okay, Billy, looks good. If they ever need you, you'll just, you know, be able to, it's like uh, people go to the driving course. You went to the driving course, didn't you? Not yet, sir. You didn't? Well, those that do, they always want to try out their driving. <laughs> and I get driven around sometimes, and I don't want to be there when they do that, but they're dying <laughs> to do it. And so, but you get my point. You got to be proficient, and that would be part of the issue. Local law enforcement, a lot of times, they are. That's the things that they do to protect the community. Understood, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Sir, Master Chief, Senior Chief Basil, uh, SEAL Team 18. For the last 40 years or so, we've been an all-volunteer force. And our op tempo has increased. And <clears throat> our families, as we all know, are very important, as you pointed out today. What is the plan? with the commissary programs, which we've heard are going to be eliminated, and MWR, for example, this theater here is an MWR function. Because you know, that's very, very important to our families. While we're gone, it gives them something to be able to do with quality of life issues, you know, like help keep their quality of life better, have more dollars to go in their pocket. So what's the plan at this point? Okay. So let me talk to you about the commissary thing. There's this business, they say, hey, we're going to, there's an option to shut commissaries. There isn't an option to shut commissaries. The option is to look at the way commissary management, so this is the DECA, and I can't remember what DECA stands for. Navy Exchange, I'll go to them first. They have a certain amount of subsidy the federal government gives them for, they get tax-free land, they uh, usually get uh, 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 real estate to build, and they don't have to pay for it. Right. We kind of give them that. And then they, they maintain a business, and they make profit, and that profit goes into MWR, as you know. So now you go over to the DECA, if you will. They, too, get subsidized. And when we looked at it, we'd be the government and it'd be the people down in the Department of Defense staff that look at broadly. They say, we sure are subsidizing you a lot, and we think you can be much more efficient based on what you do. So we would like you to be more efficient. We're going to take away some of the subsidy. Show us your plan. Uh, that has manipulated to some early plans, and I really underline early, would be, well, if we get your subsidy reduced, we, my output will reduce. And since, uh, since not all of our commissaries make money, many lose money, frankly. They don't have enough 
folks, but they're still open, and they're subsidized by others. For example, you probably do pretty well here. The, the commissaries around here are probably pretty busy. They're really busy in the Washington area. They make money, and that gets rolled over to some of the remote sites that aren't very busy. You with me? So the, the early reports were, well, these remote sites will close them. And we're saying, no, that's not the deal, DECA. You need to come and show us your business plan. So this is the, the back and forth that is going. There, there's no uh, early, there was no intent to close commissaries. Follow what I mean? It's to reduce and make them more efficient, like the Navy Exchange does. They do it. Why can't you guys do it? Now, they have some handicaps, if you will, the, the commissaries. They're required to put certain kind of, uh, certain levels of meats, certain brand name products, yada, yada, yada. And they say, hey, man, I got to stock high, if you will, high-end stuff. So if you could give me a little leeway on if you want olives, do you just want olives? Or do you have to have this kind of olive, if you get my point, and it runs all the way down. Uh, when it comes to MWR and those hesitations, I would submit to you uh, that, is a, um, that is an exception because in fiscal year 13, uh, I rattled off all those things that happened, and we were on our knees all the way. We were shut down. So how do we keep anything open when you're literally shut down and when you have sequestration? I don't expect to see that this year. I expect to see MWR to restore to normal, and I'll be keeping my eye on it. Thank you. All right. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, CNO. Good afternoon, McPon. CNG fellas, Joint Expeditionary Base, Little Creek, Fort Story. My question to you, sir, is uh, our Navy is truly a, a global force. And as we continue to draw down from the over decade of war that we've been in in Iraq and Afghanistan, my question to you is, I continuously hear a, about a focus on the Pacific. Can you speak to that uh, for us, sir, and tell us within the next five to 10 years, what actually will be the focus for us as a Navy in the Pacific? Okay. Um, there's four categories of what we call the rebalance to the Pacific. It was originally started with the term pivot, but frankly, we've been out there quite a bit, so we kind of call it a rebalance. Number one, forces, and that's airplanes and ships. That's how we speak mostly. So what you'll see is four little combat ships being forward stationed down in Singapore. That will happen within the next two and a half years. Okay, so that's an increase. You'll see an increase. Today, there's about 50 of our ships in the Western Pacific. Uh, by the end of this decade, you'll see closer to 60 ships in the Western Pacific. Uh, that increase of four, uh, the joint high-speed vessels that you have here, you're getting the first of them. There'll be others on the West. They'll go out there. The mobile landing platform that I mentioned before, that will deploy out to that area. Um, we will, when we send JHSVs and, and other new kind of ships uh, that are, as I said, they're expeditionary, they're not amphibious assault, they will help free up amphibs that we would like to send to the Western Pacific to help support the lift. They'll provide the lift to Marines in Darwin, and we owe that. That's our part of the, the Darwin Initiative. You've heard of that? Yes, sir. That I'm on board? Okay, so that's... Uh, the first squadron of Joint Strike Fighters by the end of this decade, that will be to the Western Pacific. Have you ever heard of the, uh, the Triton, the Broad Area Maritime Surveillance? It's a global hawk, UAV, big, big, big wings and all that. Flies for many, many hours and it takes a lot of pictures and all that. That will deploy. We're, that'll be out in 17. That will go to the Western Pacific. So there's a lot of high-end stuff there. Two, capability. So that's, that's forces. Two is capability. We benchmark all our capability from mine warfare to counter missile to counter ballistic missile, ASW, to the Western Pacific. It's got to work there when we buy it. Three, we, you've probably heard we are shifting home ports, 60 west, 40 east. Yes, sir. That's underway. We're at about 57% now, so we still got to continue that. And then lastly, I call it intellectual capacity. That's kind of uh, jargon, Washington jargon for, we're going to do more high-end exercises. Uh, I spend more time visiting my counterparts, discussing where we're going, and, and have more dialogue, and in richer, a richer, more uh, significant dialogue. So let me give you an example. Japan. We have really stepped up where we want to go with Japan. Operations together, ASW together, 
Uh, our P8s are operating out there now. P8 is a tricked out 737, very, very nice, replaces the P3. So we do, we do that. We're, 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 we're an interface with China more than we have been for a long, long, long time. My vice CNO, our vice CNO was there in November. Uh, my counterpart was here in the United States for a week in September. Uh, I am going in April to China. I'm going back in July. I mean, we're lucky if we got one every two years. So you can see how that's kind of picking up uh, to figure out what's going on, where do we want to go, let's get the conversation going. It's been difficult, it's grinding, but that's what we got to do to work through that. That's kind of a snapshot. Thank you, sir. All right, thank pretty you, long. Sir. Sorry you asked that question, Arch. <laughs> <laughs> thank okay? you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we're, uh, we're at time, right? Yes, sir. Okay, let me, uh, just a quick remark, and I will turn it over to Mick Pond. We talked a little bit about, hey, what's this about BAH? What's this about commissaries and all that? So let me, let me say, we are looking at compensation, and I spoke to you a little bit. I said, look, we, the, the growth in our compensation, we've got to do something about it. We've got to, we got to rest the growth, not go down, not change it down. It's about slowing the growth. Any savings we get from that that are approved, my plan is to put that into what I call the quality of your work. That's to go into uh, improving the barracks, improving your training, improving your training budget, making sure that we, work, we get more folks ready to, to cover up gaps at sea, to make sure, put money into spare parts, money into intermediate, intermediate maintenance, uh, what else? Anything else that I missed in as far as the quality of work? Mm -hmm. That sort of category will lay it out, and we have got to show, and we intend to, if we get such a thing approved, show that any savings that come there gets reinvested in your quality of work, what makes your workplace better, because your overall, if you will, existence in the Navy, as I look at it, where we invest is in your, your quality of life, your salary, your BAH, tuition assistance, uh, gyms, uh, you know, and, and, and medical benefits, things of that nature. The things that make your life what they are. And then you go to work, you walk across that pier, or you go to that flight line, or you go wherever you go. What's the quality of your work there? Do you have a trained supervisor? Do you have a supervisor? Are you trained? Is your unit trained? Are you comfortable? Is your CO confident? Is your CMC confident? Are you confident? How does all that come together? And I think we have a deficit in, in, a, in the investment in there. We need to work on that, and we will. And that's where that will go. I wanted you to kind of get that, those categories and where we're, what we're looking at. Mick Punk, closing? Just uh, two things. Uh, you know, for many years, I sat right where you're sitting, and, and I know what you're thinking when it comes to this pay and compensation and slowing of growth. What I want to share with you is I get the opportunity to sit on boards like CNO talked about, the DECA board, Defense Commissary Agency, and I get to sit in on a lot of these meetings and have a voice uh, on things that affect our families and you when it comes to pay and compensation and retirement and those things. I, you know, I would be suspect uh, if I were you, but what I'm about to tell you, but I'm going to tell you anyways. I want you to know that an extraordinary amount of effort, thought, and concern goes into these decisions on how they impact you and your families. Nothing is just done, oh, by the way, on a whim, that it takes months and years oftentimes before decisions are made. So they fully, we fully recognize the impact that it'll have on you and your families. So you always come, you know, number one, recognizing that we also have a mission that we need to perform. So I wanted to share that with you because I'm getting a lot of feedback both face to face and on social media about. Uh, you know, doubting that leadership really gets it and really cares. And uh, I think it's important for you to know that, yes, they, they care and, yes, they get it. Uh, second thing I wanted to share, I was talking with a young CS out in the lobby, and uh, I asked him, what do you do for a living? He said, kind of head down, said, uh, I work in the barracks, right? Well, what I want to share with him and all of you is that there's three things that I look at when it comes to success, the foundation to success, three basic things. And one is to that shipmate that's out there, no matter what your job is, no matter what you're asked to do, work hard every single day. Put your best foot forward because there's no such thing as a job in the Navy that's not important. So do your best every single day. Number two, stay out of trouble. 
You're going to leave here. It's a Friday afternoon. You're going to have a good weekend. Be smart about it. Don't do something to compromise all the hard work that you and in many cases your families have done to get you where you are to get you to where you are today. So stay out of trouble. Number three and most important, this ties into sexual assault prevention and suicide prevention and and domestic violence and alcohol abuse. Be a good and decent person to yourself, to your family, and to your shipmates. Be a good and decent person, and I'm pretty confident that a lot of what ails our Navy will simply just go away. So work hard, stay out of trouble, be a good and decent person. CNO, thank you so much for inviting me to be with you today. All right, buddy. Thank you. Thanks. Take care of each other. We'll see you. Attention on deck. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Go back here.